Good afternoon. At the outset, I want to say again that in this course, the emphasis is on artists and their art, not on the larger historical, political, social milieu of the Renaissance. And again, as I did in the last lecture, I want to say that historical essentials will not be ignored. Italy, after all, was a locus of ancient Italian, ancient, pardon me, ancient classical civilization, and it was also a locus of the Catholic Church from the beginnings of organized Christianity. The Christian religion and the Roman Catholic Church were the central force in Europe during the Middle Ages between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance. Europe, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the Goths in 476 AD, had only one unifying force, Christianity, as represented by the Roman Church. It was only in Italy, however, that it was also a centralizing force. It gradually assumed a role as a temporal power through a succession of events. The map of Italy, which you saw in the last lecture, we see again a 1631 map, and I point out to you the city of Rome on the Tiber, simply because that is what <clears throat> I'll be emphasizing for a few moments. In 313, the Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which granted tolerance to Christianity, one of the most important events in history. Many churches were soon built in Rome, including St. Peter's, the old, original St. Peter's, which stood for a thousand years. The Constantinian Basilica is how we refer to it, and many of the things, or some of the things that were in that Constantinian Basilica of the early fourth century are there today in the Baroque Basilica that we know to be St. Peter's. It was a, and remains, an extraordinary symbol of power, of the power specifically of the Roman Catholic Church. In the middle of the 5th century, Pope Leo I, Leo the Great, as he is usually referred to, began to assert temporal power for the church. His claim, or the claim that the church asserted for temporal power, was supported by a spurious document called the Donation of Constantine, which purported to record Constantine's gift of the Western Empire to the papacy. It was a forgery but a forgery that was only uncovered in the 15th century, in the Renaissance, in fact. Another non-event, the legend that Pope Leo had talked Attila of the Hun out of invading Rome, also furthered this claim of temporal authority. Um, Leo X in the Renaissance had himself painted as Leo I, having Attila stop at the river and not invade Rome, and there have been several bad movies uh, on the subject as, uh, as well. Uh, one of them said, they will, what they said that day will never be known. Indeed, it never will. Um, Charlemagne, uh, the next step in our story of Christian temporal power, in a sense, is Charlemagne and his coronation as Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in the year 800. The Holy Roman Empire that was thus created may be described as a union of Christian Western Europe with the Pope as spiritual leader and the Emperor as political leader. Paradoxically, this resulted in persistent conflict between the Church and the Empire of Charlemagne's successors that lasted for centuries. By the early 13th century, the papacy reached a high point of temporal power. I wanted to show you at this moment a map of Florence, uh, and the map of Florence is an engraving done in the late uh, 16th, uh, 16th century. That map of Florence uh, shows you uh, the general plan of Florence uh, with its walls, its original uh, protective walls running around it, with the Arno River running uh, through it here, running through the center of the city, not quite the center since you have much more of the city on one side than the other, and the four bridges that at that time crossed, uh, crossed the Arno. Uh, the larger side, of course, is the area where the cathedral is, there that I'm pointing with the arrow, uh, and down very near to the bridge, we have the uh, piazza which holds Palazzo Vecchio, the town hall at this point. That's the, that is the oldest and central part of the city. 
Um, we'll be dealing also in a lecture or two with the other side of the Arno, which is known in Italian as the Ultra Arno, um, the other side, and uh, which is much shallower, which quickly comes up against the walls and the hills outside of uh, Florence on that side. In Italy, the geographical centers of art around 1400 were the city-states into which the peninsula was divided. Central Italy, and especially Tuscany, came to be dominated by Florence for much of the Quattrocento. And now I've introduced a word and some Italian uh, terminology which we need to look at. In Italian, the 14th century is called the Trecento. The literal meaning is 300. It's shorthand. Mila for 1,000 is dropped. Instead of saying Mila Trecento, you say Trecento for the 1,300s. Likewise, the 15th century is called the Quattrocento and the 16th, the Cinquecento. Uh, there are others, but those are the ones that involve us. And uh, since the Italian terms are commonly used in art historical writing and speaking about Italian art, even in other countries, we will often use those terms in these lectures. Besides, they have a nice Italian role to them and are worth getting to know if you don't already. Around the year 1400, a distinctive late medieval style of art became so widespread in Europe that it has become known as the International Gothic. It flourished in Italy well into the Quattrocento. After the beginning of the Renaissance, we still had a Gothic style going on side by side. The international Gothic style is characterized by brilliant, brilliantly colored decoration, expressive drawing, usually curvilinear. Its forms, although they're three-dimensional to a degree, nonetheless favor flatness over the illusion of volume. International Gothic art is lyrical. It tends to be celebratory. The habitual use of gold ground for the gold for the backgrounds, we speak of gold ground paintings, the habitual use of that gold accentuates all of those characteristics. There is an interesting quality in international Gothic, and that is that it is naturalistic. That is to say, it is realistic in the depiction of observed details, for instance, of landscape, of animals, of costume. This is, uh, I think, a, a, a supportable definition, but it is partly mine, of naturalism. A naturalism as a detailed realism not as realism in certain other senses that we will talk about later on. But that kind of close observation of natures of the nature of uh, the details of nature, pardon me, and the details of costume and so forth is an important part of the style. The content of international Gothic art is usually religious, reflecting the dominance of the Catholic Church in European culture. Into this culture in Italy were born in the 1370s and the 1380s an important group of artists, some like Lorenzo Monaco and Gentile da Fabriano, retained the Gothic style of their youth, uh, making art of great decorative expressiveness. Others, like Lorenzo Ghiberti, began their career in the late medieval style and ended in the newly developing style, the art of the Renaissance, the style, if you will, of the Renaissance. The three artists just mentioned were all connected with Florence, though not all the time. Lorenzo Monaco's paintings uh, are marked by intimacy and uh, restraint, uh, by a delicate lyricism. He was born in Siena, not in Florence, about 1370. Uh, he moved to Florence where he entered a monastery uh, and practiced his art. That's where he got his name, of course. Monaco means monk. So Lorenzo the monk, Lorenzo Monaco. And by the way, we never say Monaco. It's either the whole name or Lorenzo, once you've established who you're talking about. I wanted to show you a very small and very charming panel which is in the Metropolitan Museum in the Lehman Wing. Uh, this is a nativity, but it is a small uh, panel which, is, which was once part of a large altarpiece. We don't know what altarpiece now. These became separated. I mentioned the Duccio's Maestà had been cut up and sold, uh, parts of it sold off. That happened very frequently and predella panels, because they were small, were the first to go. A predella, I must say, is the pedestal of an altarpiece. The bottom part is separate like a, like, a, like a support for the bottom of the frame, and it's often decorated with or composed of small paintings whose subjects reflect the theme of the large altarpiece above, and often, if there are individual saints above, for instance, specifically connected between the saint and the scene in the predella below. That in this course, 
The emphasis is on artists and their art, not on the larger historical, political, social milieu of the Renaissance. And again, as I did in the last lecture, I want to say that historical essentials will not be ignored. Italy, after all, was a locus of ancient Italian, ancient, pardon me, ancient classical civilization, and it was also a locus of the Catholic. Good afternoon. At the outset, I want to say again, the higher and the Renaissance. Europe, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the Goths in 476 AD, had only one unifying force, Christianity, as represented by church from the beginnings of organized Christianity. The Christian religion and the Roman Catholic Church were the central force in Europe during the Middle Ages between the fall of the Roman Empire